I'm Limo Milan, and we're going to look at third party plugin workflows. So, firstly, third party plugins are additional plugins that you add within Ableton Live that could be from different companies and different vendors. So, in order to kind of understand that, let's first have a look at preferences and look at how we make those happen. So, if we go to um, preferences menu here, we go to the plugins tab. You can see that you can enable a type of plugin called an audio unit, which is um, Apple um, Mac specific. Um, so if you have those installed on your Mac system, you can enable those and, and um, allow them to be used. However, bear in mind, if you rely on using audio unit versions of plugins and you want to pass a project to a friend who uses a Windows-based computer, they can't load audio unit versions of those plugins. So if you are wanting to share projects that use third-party plugins, it's best to try and use the VST format. So we have two different formats here. We have the VST2 and the VST3 formats. VST3 has a lot more sort of intelligent interaction with the door itself. It's available for some plugins, but not for all. VST2 is still probably the most popular version of the VST standard at the moment. So upon opening um, Ableton Live for the first time, what you will need to do is enable that plugin systems folder, and that will get you started to where we are now, where we can load in some VST uh, plugins. Then um, we have plugin window behavior, which is in terms of what will happen when you have one plugin open and you move to another part of a project, whether it stays there or whether it doesn't. So we have the ability to have multiple plugin windows open at any one time. If you don't have that enabled, it means that when you open one plugin on a track and then open the next to view it, the other one will shut and they'll, they'll basically move out of each other's way. So that's a preference in time that you'll find that you prefer it one way or the other. We have the auto hide plugins window, which means as you move from one track to another, the plugins will disappear out of view and, and basically not stay around whilst you focus on different parts of your project. And then upon loading uh, a plugin, you have auto open the plugin window, which is the floating window for that particular plugin that will open up for you. So let's load in a plugin and we'll get started at kind of the workflow aspect of this. So I've gone to the plugins folder here. You all have an, an audio units folder up here if you've enabled that, but I'm just using VSTs. And I'm gonna load in Native Instruments Massive plugin onto this track. Okay, so let's have a look at the preferences again. Just have those in view. So remember we had the auto open plugin windows open. So basically it automatically saved us the bother of going from this state with the device for the, the plugin down here and opening up the window. So it automatically opens. A shortcut for that is you press Alt and Command and P, you can open and close those windows as you work on that track. So it's really good for quickly getting it because you can see these quite big windows sometimes, pulling them into view when you need them and then shutting them down when you don't need them anymore. So the actual um, plugins themselves, if they have more than 64 available parameters, we have to personally make Ableton Live show those parameters if we want to use them for either MIDI mapping or automation. So there's this um, open close tab here which is our device parameters. And by default, if there's more than 64, it will show none of them because there was too many for it to show in a way that we could digest what's available for us. So if I open the configure tab and we go to, well, Massive opens up for us because it knows what we're trying to do. Let's say I have Massive open and I know that I always want to control the cutoff for the filter section. That's something I always want to automate when I use it from one day to the next. If I move the actual dial there, it appears with, as a slider within the device view. So not the plugin open window, the device view itself. And then if I close configure down, that now means that that slider is available to show as automation in session view or arrangement view. Now I mentioned doing uh, MIDI mapping. If I want to do MIDI mapping, a quicker way of getting that to appear within the actual device parameter view there is to go into MIDI map mode and just click the thing I want to control. So let's say it's the macro one. I want to map eight, you know, up to eight macros to my, my controller. So if I click that, it also appears in the device parameter window. So it's a quick way to get those things there as you want them. Now I'm doing this manually. I've opened up this plugin and I'm setting it in the way that I want it today. But if I want to set it up in a way that it always opens this way by default, once I've set up my configuration of device parameters, I can control click that and I can go to save as default configuration. So it's saying I already have one saved because I've previously been doing this, but if I press yes to that, it will overwrite the previous one. And now if I just delete massive and load massive in again, 
we open the device parameter, and we see those two device parameters available within the device view there, again, for automation or MIDI mapping and so on as well. So that gives us a default state of how we might want to save our devices as we work. But another thing we might want to do is create different starting points for different types of sounds for a particular plugin. So going beyond what we have here and having this every time you open Massive as a whole and you have these parameters, we can start thinking about what we want available per type of preset that we load in or starting point loading in uh, Massive in this case. So let's say I want it to be that this is my base starting point. I always want those two sliders because I know I'm going to be designing base. I want those two things to be available immediately within Ableton Live rather than having to configure and show them each time. Now, saving as default, of course, will save it globally. It will always open that way. I want to save it for a base. So what we can do is start venturing into the rack system. So if I control and click this and I group that massive instance, this is now contained within an instrument rack. And an instrument rack can be saved with various different names. And obviously, when I make different configurations, it will save those to the name that I give it to. So if I name this, so if I go to rename, and I call this massive base starter. So I'll save that in there. If I go to save, it will go to my user library and save that in there in my instrument racks presets. And from now on, that will be my starting point for using that particular plugin uh, for base starting. So in terms of how this works, if we want to say make this a good workflow with what we're doing, it might be that I want to have, let's say we'll get configure open again. And let's just add a few more things. And let's say this is like my, my favorite pad starting point and so on. So I always know I want to use those types of parameters when I'm working with pad sounds. So this time I'm going to go to rename this massive, let's call this pad starter. So I go to save again. That gets saved in my user library. So I now have two different starting points. I have the starting point for um, massive pad starter and I have the starting point for the base pad as well. There we go. There's a fresh load in. It's loaded in the right configuration there. Just checking that in terms of uh, reloading those in so it showed as I expected it to. Okay, so we've got the, the plugins loaded in. I've only worked with instrument plugins so far. So let me just do this another time with an audio processing plugin to show that it's not just instruments that we can do this with. So if I go to plugins and I find something, let's say guitar rig. So I'll load that in there. And it could be that I have a certain starting point that I like to have, so maybe some amplifiers loaded in there by default. Now, in terms of seeing those parameters, by the way, in terms of a workflow with the VSTs, we can always do the configuration and, and show it by going to the configuration mode to bring the device parameters into the device view at the bottom there. But another thing we can do is once we've actually clicked one of these parameters, they are actually available within our automation view. So they're not necessarily available within the configuration list here for the device parameters. But if I'm in a, a clip here and I have my envelope open, you'll notice that the last thing I clicked on guitar rig in that case is available now as an automation lane. So you don't always have to go to that configure device parameters section to add these in. If on the fly you decide that gain control and that amp I've just added, I really want to automate it. If you just click it, it will show as an automation lane within your clip in um, a session view or on the actual automation track within arrangement view as well. Okay, so we've looked at different workflows when we're using third-party plugins and how we can get the windows to behave in different ways depending on what it is we want to do as we navigate the actual projects. We've talked about saving a default for every third-party plugin that we might have in our library, but then also using the rack systems to save particular states for the plugins to load in at. So when we're doing different things with the same plugin, we can start with a different starting point based on how we save them.